Well, I guess I'll get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Fred Bortz, uh, curator of the uh, series that we've been calling Science Adventures from the Monroeville Public Library. Um, we have had, this is our second Zoom talk in the series. We haven't had nearly as many talks this year, but one advantage of doing it over Zoom is we can get a, a speaker from uh, far away. In this case, I guess you're in Virginia at the moment. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how uh, I was able to invite Heidi Hamill uh, to speak to us tonight. Several of you probably know her name. Um, if you're uh, of my generation or maybe even slightly younger, uh, you would uh, certainly slightly younger. You might remember when she became temporarily, temporarily uh, at least nationally, if not world famous for her enthusiastic presentation of the images of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 striking Jupiter. Um, she was uh, a project leader on the Hubble Space Telescope at the time. Um, and that event um, got the attention of people who were doing a book series called Women's Adventures in Science. Um, and they identified Heidi as a likely candidate to have her biography written. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get the assignment to write her biography, uh, which turned into this book. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It's called Beyond Jupiter, the story of planetary astronomer Heidi Hamill. Um, and uh, it was the best writing assignment that I've ever had. Um, this, not only was the, the content so much fun, uh, but I got a trip to Hawaii to the top of Mauna Kea to uh, spend three overnights with the observation team. Uh, Heidi was one of several people who had time on the um, infrared telescope facility of NASA. So um, I have that book and actually there's a link on the page that I've put here in the chat um, that has the story of uh, how the book came to be written. So you can uh, follow that or go there if, you, if you're interested at some point afterwards. Um, the book unfortunately has been taken out of print. It was a whole wonderful series. Um, it ran for about 15 years before they did that. Um, and I have enough copies of it that if you're interested, I put my email in the chat as well and you can contact me. But now let me tell you about Heidi, um, who is a very generous spirit. Uh, I, I have to say it's been um, wonderful getting, it was wonderful getting to know her. It's been wonderful knowing her now for uh, 18 years. Uh, Heidi received her undergraduate degree from MIT and her PhD from the University of Hawaii in astronomy. Uh, she's currently the vice president for science of Aura, which is a consortium that operates a, a, a number of large astronomical observatories, including the Hubble Space Telescope, the Gemini Observatory, and more. Um, Dr. Hamill, Heidi, primarily studies the outer planets, um, which is why the book was called Beyond Jupiter. Um, uh, and she served on the imaging team for the Voyager 2 Neptune encounter, and she studied Uranus and Neptune. She told me how to pronounce Uranus. Uh, uh, extensively with Hubble, with the Keck double domes on uh, Mauna Kea and other facilities. She still is active as a scientist. Um, she's an interdisciplinary science for the James Webb Space Telescope, which uh, we hope goes into space soon, um, heading out for one of the um, nodes where it can look, look at Earth and be shielded from the sun, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, and she's planning to use her guaranteed obs observation time to study a diverse array of solar system targets, including the outer planets. She's been recognized both for her science and especially, I would say, her work in public outreach. Um, she's 
received the Sagan Medal, the San Francisco Exploratorium's Public Understanding of Science Award. And last year, she received the American Astronomical Society's Masursky Award for outstanding service to planetary science and exploration. Uh, Heidi gets around the solar system because asteroid 1981 EC20 was renamed 3530 Hamill in her honor. I don't know what the 3530 means. Maybe she'll tell us, but it's a great pleasure to have Heidi here. And I'm going to shut up and let her talk. Thank you so much, Fred. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to share my love of the ice giant planets with you. And I'm going to try sharing my screen, make sure it all works. And let me start the slideshow. How does that look? Does it look good to you all? Good. Great, thank you. All right, so this is gonna be a, a whirlwind tour of two of my favorite planets in the solar system. These are the planets that we call Uranus and Neptune. And they're kind of special in our solar system. Um, I have a little cartoon that sort of shows you sort of the main planets in our solar system. If you wanna talk about Pluto, we can do that in the Q&A. Um, but this is just a little graphic showing you the, the basic eight, the eight planets. So there's really three classes of planets. There are the terrestrial planets. These are the small rocky planets like Earth and Mercury and Venus and Mars. And there are also two gas giant planets, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And in between are what we call the ice giant planets. Um, in the olden days, back when I was a student in the elderly days, uh, we called them all gas giants, but we've actually learned a lot about these planets with our spacecraft and telescopes. And the reason we make a distinction here and call these ice giants is because of what's inside them. Um, Jupiter and Saturn are gigantic balls of gas. They're just hydrogen. And, and even at depth, it's uh, just a different form of hydrogen called metallic hydrogen. Uh, but Uranus and Neptune are different. Inside their cores, they have a thick mantle of other materials like water and ammonia and methane. And um, in astronomical terms, those are what we call ices. Now I wanna be clear that they're not cold like ice in our fridge or freezer. Um, they're actually hot ice but that term ice means heavier than gas. So it's heavier than hydrogen. And so they also do have some cores um, inside and we'll talk a little bit more about their interiors, but they're really very different from Jupiter and Saturn. They're a fundamentally different class of planet in our solar system. And you can see a little earth there for scale to give you a sense of the difference in size between earth and the ice giants and Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, just a, a, a fun fact about those, uh, you all know how long it takes Earth to spin on its axis, how long a day is, that's 24 hours. Um, Uranus and Neptune, their days are around 17 hours. So even though they're much bigger than the Earth, they spin faster than Earth. And Jupiter and Saturn, they, their actual rotation periods are close to nine hours. So these giant balls of gas spin really, really fast. Now, uh, these are the kinds of planets we have in our solar system. Um, something that you may not be aware of is that our solar system isn't alone anymore. We now know of thousands of planets around other stars, uh, literally thousands. Last I checked uh, yesterday and it was uh, 4,558 confirmed planets around other stars. And if we make a little chart of how many of those planets fall into different size ranges, you see that the Jupiter-sized planets, that's the small red bar, and the Earth-sized planets, that's the small yellow or gold bar. But that middle blue bar, that's the number of Neptune-sized planets. Um, and you will also notice the green bar and the dark blue bar, those are either sub-Neptunes or uh, super-Neptunes, we don't even have that class of planet in our solar system. And so studying Neptune is really, really important. Neptune and Uranus both are for, important for helping us fill out this um, 
gap of, of, of planets that we don't have in our solar system, but we see around other stars. So if it's so important, surely we have sent many, many missions to those planets, right? Actually, no. This cartoon, um, all those little squiggly lines are missions to other planets. And there's been exactly one mission that has gone by the ice giant planets. And that was the Voyager 2 mission that was launched in 1977. And it flew by Uranus in 1986. And then it continued on past Neptune in 1989. And since then, it's been flying out into interstellar space. That's the only time that we've flown by these planets. Those are the only spacecraft images we have. And that's why these images of Uranus uh, on the left and Neptune on the right are kind of our canonical pictures of these worlds. We don't have any better pictures than these because we've never sent another spacecraft there. And it's very difficult to observe these planets from the Earth because they are so far from the sun. Um, they are at the, at the close to the edge of our solar system. And so even with the most powerful telescopes, it's a challenge to observe them. Um, these are two artist concepts of what the sun looks like from Uranus in the circle and then behind it from Neptune. And you know what our sun to us is a big bright star in the sky, but from Uranus and Neptune, they're so far away from the sun and from us that the sun is, is really just a, a brighter star. It doesn't even look like a sun. Um, so it's really hard to do this work. Nevertheless, um, I've made a career of trying to understand uh, these planets and their atmospheres. And so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but I wanna give you a flavor of what we've learned about Uranus and Neptune over the years of the planet and its ring system, their ring systems and their moons and their interiors. So let's talk first about their atmospheres. Um, the next picture is gonna show you um, the canonical picture of Uranus that the Voyager spacecraft took, which was used for the cover of, of um, Science Magazine when it was reporting all the results. And that's the picture of Uranus they used. Very dramatic, sort of backlit. The sun is behind you and you're seeing that illuminated edge. And the reason they use this dramatic picture is when you looked at Uranus from the front side, the fully illuminated disk, that's what the planet looked like. It was really almost nothing to see. It was like a blank billiard cue ball. There was like no clouds. Um, and uh, for those of you who are, are amateur astronomers, if there are some out there, that size that I've marked there in purple, 3.8 arc seconds, that's how big this disk is as seen from Earth. And for those of you who are astronomers, you will say, holy smokes, that's really small. Um, for those of you who aren't astronomers, that let me just tell you, that's really small. <laughs> um, even with our best telescopes, it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, but I will share with you that in these Voyager images, we did spot 10 different clouds and some real subtle banding. And so that, that was interesting. Um, but our real advances um, in the studying the atmosphere of Uranus really came after Voyager when we started to use advanced telescopes on Earth. And when I say, um, you know, people say, you're an astronomer. Oh, you know, can I see your telescope? I'm like, well, you'll have to go to Mauna Kea. And um, that's a picture of one of my telescopes. Uh, this is a picture of the mirror of the Keck telescope. And it's one, of, it's one of the largest in the world. The diameter of the mirror is 10 meters. For scale, that red splotch in the middle, that's a person who is sort of crouching in the middle of the telescope there to give you a sense of scale of how big these telescopes are. And this telescope has what we call adaptive optics. And so this telescope can actually flex its shape and flex the shape of the optics to take out the motion of Earth's atmosphere. And that's what we call adaptive optics. So, you know, Earth's atmosphere kind of messes up images. Uh, we're, it's like looking through a, a swimming pool to see stars and planets. Um, but when we um, use adaptive optics, we can remove that. 
And so here's a picture that we took of Uranus using that 10 meter telescope in July of 2004. And this picture, the adaptive optics are turned off. So this is what natural seeing looks like, the Earth's atmosphere smearing out our image. But when we turn on the adaptive optics, it's almost like magic, but it's not magic, it's science. Um, this is what you see when you turn the adaptive optics on. You see many, many cloud features that were just lost in the smear of Earth's atmosphere. And you can see um, a bright band off to the side that encircles the south polar region of this planet. Um, the reason it's sideways is this planet is actually turned over on its side. It rotates on its side. And uh, here's a little cartoon uh, showing you uh, the rotation axis of the planet as a function of its year. And those are actual Earth years. So in, 19, in 1986, when Voyager flew by, the planet's south pole was pointing directly at the sun. So no matter how much that planet was spinning, half the planet was in sunlight all the time and the other half of the planet was in complete darkness all of the time and over the last um you know 20 30 years uranus has been traveling around its orbit around the sun and in 2007 uh, the planet was sideways to the sun so the whole planet was now illuminated all the time and um we suspect that this strange illumination may be linked to the fact that Voyager uh, pretty much saw nothing. That's a, the Voyager picture. Um, but as the years went by and we started using Hubble and Keck, um, here's a Hubble image. And, and you can see now from Earth, we're starting to see more banded structure. And you see there's like these bright pink spots on the side and you see the ring system of Uranus. And then in, when we got to the actual equinox um, or thereabouts, um, yeah, now my computer just decided not to show any more slides to you. Let me try, let me try going back and doing it again. There we go. Um, here you can see now uh, we're past equinox and you can see the bright clouds and things that I was talking about. And so what's going to happen as we move towards the next solstice in 2028? It's a great question, and we don't know the answer. Because look at the time scales here. Um, we haven't had modern telescopes and cameras and things, computers like we've had, um, uh, to, to study this. So this is all new for us, watching this change in the planet Uranus. And I want to show you next the best best pictures of Uranus we've ever taken with the Keck telescope. And that's what the planet Uranus looks like to the Keck telescope. Um, we had to do a lot of image, image processing on these images, but you can clearly see a lot of strange things happening in the polar region. Uh, you can see beautiful banded structure, you see bright clouds, you see equatorial waves, um, all kinds of interesting things going on. Those are the equatorial waves. You see that repeated pattern. Um, you can see what we call popcorn clouds in the, in the northern region of Uranus. And interestingly, um, Saturn's polar region seems to have cloud structure somewhat analogous to this. It's kind of mysterious though. And these are, these are what we, in, uh, we call moist convective clouds. Um, that's another, that's a fancy term for a, a big thunderstorm that extends high into the atmosphere. So the planet Uranus, um, it's gotten a bad rap over the years as being uninteresting, but I hope that um, these pictures have convinced you that actually it is really very interesting. Um, and there's a lot of fantastic science there. Um, Neptune, to, uh, to move to Neptune now, um, we knew prior to Voyager that it would be much more interesting. Um, some of the work that I did for my PhD thesis was trying to track clouds on Neptune back in the elder days before adaptive optics. So uh, we could see fuzzy blobs, we knew there'd be clouds, and uh, Neptune did not disappoint for the Voyager encounter. Um, this is a 2.3 arc second disk, uh, which is even harder to study uh, with ground-based telescopes. But Neptune had a big dark spot and it had bright clouds and it had 
the fast moving clouds and, and all sorts of interesting cloud dynamics for us um, in 1989 when Voyager flew by. And so um, I was already geared up planning to study this great dark spot uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, there were some challenges with Hubble, and we can talk about that if you want. But in the end, everything was working and fine. And I, when I got my first images of Hubble with, um, first images of Neptune with the Hubble Space Telescope, I was blindsided because that great dark spot was completely gone. And what we saw was a different great dark spot in the northern hemisphere of the planet where no one had ever seen a dark spot with Voyager. So that was really surprising. Um, and we were kind of baffled by that. Uh, the great red spot on Jupiter has lasted for hundreds of years. And so we weren't really ready for a great dark spot to disappear within five years. And nevertheless, that's what it did. And then even that dark spot went away. Um, here's a set of images that was taken on the Neptune anniversary uh, by Hubble in 2011. This was taken exactly in the same part of the sky where Neptune was when it was discovered 165 years earlier. That's why we called it the anniversary image. But there was no great dark spot. That's like, the, you can see the whole planet there. It's not there. Uh, but we keep looking with Hubble. Um, uh, and, and here is a series of images um, taken in 2015 to 2017. And in the bottom, you can see our zoom ins where we have another great dark spot uh, right around the same place that the Voyager great dark spot was. And you can see it fade away over the course of just two years. And very recently, just um, last year, uh, Neptune popped out with a new northern great dark spot. So a lot of change on this planet. Um, the weird dark spots come and go. Uh, and what does it all mean? Um, if you're going to ask me detailed questions, I saw earlier, uh, Sean has joined this telecon and he's an expert even more than I am on atmosphere of Neptune. And so I'm going to make him answer any questions if people have questions about why are they coming and going. Um, the winds are definitely wild on the ice giant planets. Um, the squiggly line on the far left is Jupiter's wind profile. And the two other uh, more sedate wiggles, uh, those are uh, the wiggles on Uranus and Neptune. And they look calmer, but their amplitude is much larger. And so what that means is that their winds are extremely fast. Um, they get up to something like 1,300 miles per hour. So we have been talking about Hurricane Ida and winds of 130 miles per hour. The winds on Neptune routinely blow 10 times faster than the strong hurricanes here on Earth. So it's a pretty uh, wild weather planet. Is that why the big cloud features um, don't last there? Maybe. Um, we'll have to be, we're working on trying to answer questions like that. So now let me turn to the moon systems um, because I want to talk a little bit about them. Um, the moons of Uranus are astonishing. <laughs> um, they're just really remarkable. Uh, Miranda, uh, which means miracle, um, is one of the smaller moons of Uranus, and yet it has one of the most tortured landscapes in the solar system. Um, I remember when these images were coming down from the spacecraft, I was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for the Uranus flyby, and when these images of Miranda appeared with that bizarre upside down check mark, um, we were baffled, never seen anything like that before. Um, you can see that there are some craters. So it's, um, it's a relatively young surface uh, because it's easy to spot the craters. Unlike um, the moon Titania um, to, the, to the right there, that's covered with craters everywhere that you look. And so that's a very old surface in the outer solar system. Miranda is a younger surface. And so these strange um, structures uh, could be due to warmth 
underneath upwelling and splitting uh, the icy crust into pieces and, and letting the pieces kind of move around. Um, the moon Ariel um, also has some really interesting, very bright and very dark spots together. Um, umbriel, uh, the, the, if you look at the very top of the umbriel image, you can see a really white streak. It's like a bright white crater at the northern part of umbriel. And um, Oberon is a, is a classic ice covered ball. These are all balls of dirty ice, right? They're mostly ice, and I, they're, but they're so far out in the solar system that it is so cold that this ice has the consistency of rock. And so all the structure that you see there is structure in the ice of, uh, that's covering these worlds. Um, I'm showing you these sort of piecemeal bits. I, I wanna mention little tiny puck there. You can see him. Uh, he's a little small, um, little small moon of Uranus. Someone asked me some time ago why, what these names, where they're from. And you'll notice that uh, if you're a scholar of Shakespeare, uh, that all of these names come from Shakespearean characters. Um, that is the convention for moons of Uranus. They are named after Shakespearean characters. So why am I only showing you bits and pieces? Why am I not showing you the full moon? Well, uh, the answer is goes back to what I showed you before. At the flyby, um, we were only seeing only half of the moons. Only half of the moons were illuminated, right? Because of this bizarre configuration where the planet is tilted over on its side rotating, the moons also were all rotating along there. And so only half of the moon was illuminated. So if I show you complete maps of the Uranian satellites, uh, that's what they look like. <laughs> you can see half of every moon. Um, we would love to go back now, now that those other halves are being illuminated. We are now far enough around that those are in illumination. But these moons are so small that even with our most powerful telescopes, we can't resolve the disks of them. We can measure their brightness, but it's the integrated brightness. We can't, you know, we can't resolve structure. So that's going to have to wait uh, until the next mission. Neptune also has lots of moons and ring arcs, and um, they also uh, they have a. Uh, what I want to say here. Well, let me show you sort of the most important, the most interesting. Most of these are real small moons and they're all close in. That's what this little diagram is showing you. But there's another moon that's further out named Triton. And Triton is a fascinating moon. Uh, here's, a, here's a zoom in of Triton and some of the other moons to scale. And what's really fascinating about Triton, look at that moon. Do you see any craters? You do not. There are no craters to be seen. It's incredibly fresh young surface. Um, and not only that, but this moon orbits backwards around Neptune and it orbits in a really cockeyed orbit that's tilted like 17 degrees away from the regular moon plane, moon ring plane. In fact, we believe that this is a Kuiper belt object, a cousin of Pluto's that was captured by Neptune many, many years ago. And in fact, it's almost exactly the same size as Pluto. And so Triton and Pluto are a really wonderful pair to do comparative planetology, to study processes on the surfaces of these icy, worlds out at the edge of the solar system because Pluto is intact in its orbit, but Neptune has been captured, but Triton has been captured by Neptune. And one of the most remarkable discoveries of the Voyager mission was on this moon Triton. If you notice there's um, on the right hand side, you see occasionally what look like black splotches when Voyager did a close flyby to the moon Triton, it actually was able to detect that there were active cryovolcanoes on Triton. Um, that, that little, that one that circled at the top there, you can see the two red bars. They're showing you from the surface of Triton to, the, to a little streak that goes straight up 
and then go straight across. And that little street going straight up is eight kilometers high. That is an eruption of a geyser from the surface of Triton, eight kilometers straight up, that's then picked up by the thin atmosphere of Triton and sheared out into that long streak just up at the top there. And we saw, we were able to see two of them actively erupting like this one. And then I have also circled other black streaks there where we assume that there were active uh, cryovolcanoes as well. Um, though, although we did not see the actual eruptions, we only saw two of the actual eruptions, just because Voyager was doing a fast flyby, and it only had time to take a few images of Triton. So what this means is that when uh, we ever go back to Triton, that that moon is going to look really different. That moon is being actively resurfaced and changed in real time as we're watching. Now, why do I call it a cryovolcano? I call it a cryovolcano because cryo, that adjective means cold. These are not hot volcanoes. These are ice volcanoes. What is driving them? Great question. Um, th that picture that you see there is the best picture we have. And so it's not good enough to give us any details on the mechanisms um, that are driving these volcanoes. We have a lot of theories um, about it. Um, we have theories about nitrogen trapped under the ice and the, the even out there, there's enough faint sunlight to warm up the pockets underneath and then these jets can escape. That's one theory, um, but we're really gonna need another mission uh, to truly understand what's going on with these active volcanoes um, out there on Neptune's moon Triton. It's pretty exciting stuff. Let's turn now to the rings. Um, everybody knows Saturn has rings, but not everybody knows that all of our giant planets have rings. And in fact, uh, Uranus and Neptune have really complex and robust ring systems. Um, this is a cartoon that shows you on the left, the Uranus ring system, and on the right, the Neptune ring system, as well as embedded moons. And um, what's uh, interesting about Uranus's rings is that they're more like hula hoops than, uh, than you would imagine Saturn's rings. I, I think everybody's seen pictures of Saturn's rings and they're like, they're broad sheaths of dust and ice in orbiting. Um, in the case of Uranus, there's many discrete hula hoops, lots of them, and the moons are embedded in them. And, and in fact, um, uh, well, let me, I'll get to that. Um, let me talk then about Neptune's rings. Um, can you see my cursor when I move it on the screen? Can anyone see it? Sort of, kind of. Um, Neptune rings actually are not uniform. They have what we call arcs or clumps in them. And that really puzzled us prior to the Voyager flyby because the way we discovered the, these rings of Uranus and Neptune was by a technique called stellar occultations. We looked at a star and then we watched as the planet moved in front of the star and across it. And as the planet moves in front of the star, the starlight winks out. And we, we use that data to study the atmosphere. We look at how much the atmosphere cuts off the starlight. But in the case of Uranus, um, at one occultation, the starlight, before the planet got to the star, the starlight started winking on and off. And then the planet passed by. And then when the planet left, the starlight was winking on and off again. And it was detecting the presence of the rings. So everyone thought, well, that's a great way to find rings. Let's look for rings around Neptune. So they did stellar occultations of Neptune. And sure enough, some people saw those stars winking on and off, but other people didn't. And, and they said, well, those people must be wrong because we didn't see the winking. And other was like, well, yes, we saw the winking, it's real. And there was a big battle about this. Did it have rings or did it not have rings? And it wasn't until Voyager flew by um, and actually did some you know, full imaging that you could see that those rings were in fact there, but that they were clumpy. So let me show you some um, more modern um, Uranus pictures. All right, apparently if I talk too long, my computer decides not to show me any more slides. So let me do this. 
Okay. Um, this is a picture of Uranus with the Hubble Space Telescope, where you can see the main rings, the brighter ones, and then a dotted line. And then underneath, you could see a very faint arc. That was the Hubble Space Telescope discovery of new rings of the planet Uranus in 2005. And our team decided to go do follow-up work on these new rings of Uranus um, with the Keck telescope. Hubble found this new ring, uh, the U2 ring, and also um, another new ring, uh, the U1 ring. And when we then went and, um, gosh darn it, my computer is really giving me trouble. I'm going to go back and see if I can make it go. There we go. So this is a picture from a paper that we wrote on the top is the Saturn ring system along with its red ring, the G ring, and a blue ring called the E ring. The lower picture, that is the planet Uranus with its main ring system and its new red ring and its new blue ring. The red ring and blue rings were newly discovered by our teams um, in 2005 and 2006. And we found those colors by looking with Keck. And um, the what's really, what's really interesting about this <laughs> is that for Saturn, that blue ring has a really good explanation. Saturn's moon Enceladus is embedded in that blue ring. And Saturn's moon Enceladus is jetting fresh water out of its southern pole. And the claim is that that is what is causing the blue ring, fresh water from Enceladus. So then I asked the question, okay, well then what's causing the blue ring around Uranus? It does have a little tiny moon embedded in there. If you go back, if I can go back one slide, it's this little tiny moon Mab. But Mab is too small <laughs> to be jetting water out. Um, it's, a, it's a little ice ball. We don't believe that it could be jetting the water out. So it is a mystery to us of why uh, this ring is very blue at Uranus. Um, another mystery that um, we'll have to wait for a mission to solve because um, we're now past the ring, the equinox, which is when we could do all these ring observations. And um, it's getting harder and harder to observe those rings. So a big question mark there. Here's that promised uh, Neptune picture uh, from Voyager. Uh, the planet is terribly overexposed here, but you can see the rings. And here you can see the clumps in the rings. So you can see that the ring was a complete ring, but some sections were much thicker and those sections were easier to find with occultations. Um, here, uh, sadly, this is our very best ground-based picture of the rings and it's not great. Um, it's a super long exposure where we've uh, had to block out Neptune and then we pasted in another Neptune picture there. But this, this, this uh, very faint stuff here, that's, these are the best images of the rings of Neptune with the Keck telescope. Um, very, very hard to do, um, which is again, why we need a mission to study these, um, these things. Um, and here is um, another image. Um, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope because you, some of you may have been saying, well, maybe you need to use Hubble, not Keck. Can't Hubble get a great picture of Neptune's ring arcs? Well, th this is it, folks. This is as good as it gets with the Hubble Space Telescope. Those little splotches there, um, that's as good as we could do with the rings. We can see there are other moons, um, but the ring arcs are just like, you know, right at the edge of what we call noise in our data. So it's tough. Um, so uh, it's the best we can do. <laughs> we try hard. All right, let's talk about magnetic fields because there's a, an interesting story here for Uranus and Neptune. First, let me talk about magnetic fields in general. The, the picture on the, the far left, that's the Earth, all right? Earth has a magnetic field. We call it a dipole field. It's like having a big gigantic bar magnet inside the Earth. And on Earth, our magnetic field uh, is more or less aligned with our rotation axis. There's a little bit of a tilt which is why the magnetic North Pole is a little different from the rotational North Pole, but it, it's, a, it's more or less aligned. It's only off by like 10 degrees, 11 degrees. 
The next one in the middle is Jupiter. Jupiter also has a dipole magnetic field, a, like a big bar magnet inside it. And it's also pretty well aligned. It's only about 10 degrees off of the rotation pole. The next one is Saturn. Saturn's got a nice dipole field, almost exactly aligned with its rotation pole. Okay, and so when Voyager flew by Uranus, one of the things it was going to do was measure the magnetic field, because we can't do that from Earth. It's not possible to do it. We don't have the technology. You have to be in the magnetic field to sense it, all right? And so one of the most strangest things that was found was the, the magnetic field for Uranus was offset from the center of the planet significantly. And it was tilted, not like just 10 degrees, but almost 60 degrees. So offset and tilted at a completely bizarre angle. And people are like, holy smokes, you know, that is nuts. It gives you a really weird um, magnetic uh, interactions. You don't get normal aurorae like you do on Earth or Jupiter or Saturn. You get these weird blobby aurorae. And people are like, how can this be? Well, it, it must have been because of the gigantic collision that knocked Uranus over on its side. And that screwed up the interior. And that's why the magnetic field's all messed up. That was our story. That was our story until we got to Neptune, flew by Neptune, measured its magnetic fields. And guess what? That magnetic field also was tilted almost 50 degrees away from the rotation axis and shifted almost a third of the diameter of the planet away from the center of the planet. And so that nice story about the collision that messed up Uranus causing this, no. This is something to do with the interior structure of ice giant planets. And remember what I said in the beginning of this talk, um, all right, let's go here. Um, the interior of this planet is different. It has this, this white region. It's not white, it's colored white in this picture, um, which we call the mantle. And for ice giants, it appears that the magnetic field does not arise near the core, but actually arises in the mantle, offset from the center of the planet and tilted at a scurry angle. And so how stable are this offset tilted magnetic fields, we don't know because we can't measure them from Earth. Um, we have been able to measure, we believe, some auroral activity on Uranus with the Hubble Space Telescope. But given the 30 years between the Hubble observations and the Voyager flyby, we can't link them together. So we don't know um, if Uranus is stable. We don't know if Neptune's magnetic field is stable, and we haven't been able to detect Neptune's magnetic field at all, or its aurorae at all, even with the Hubble Space Telescope. So a lot of interesting and uh, unanswered questions about the interiors. But here's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the interiors. <coughs> um, I'm not going to go into a lot of great detail here, but I will share <clears throat> that we really don't even have a solid idea of what the interiors are like. Uh, we don't know if there's um, really discrete layers like you would see in, in option A in these suite of models, or if it's more that things are transitioning very smoothly as you would see over in, in option D. Or maybe it's a mixture where the upper atmosphere is smooth, but there's a discrete transition at the bottom or vice versa. These are all the kinds of things that um, we will require an orbiting spacecraft to answer um, because we, we really, um, we can model all we want. And if you have questions about the modeling, Sean will be happy to answer them. But until we get data, we will not be able to constrain these models. So everything will be staying on a theoretical basis. That said, there are some very interesting theories about some of the shenanigans that take place deep in the interior of ice giant planets. And one of the things that I think is the most fun is this idea that diamonds rain out of the deep atmosphere down onto the core of the planet. 
Um, there's a, a, a couple of different um, articles uh, that have been studying um, the chemistry that takes place in the atmosphere of Neptune and Uranus, but under extremely high pressures like you'd find in these planetary interiors. And they have these ideas um, that um, the materials might actually turn into diamonds. And I thought I'd just give you a, like a 30 second tutorial on how that might be. Um, for those of you like Sean, who will be interested in the details, um, this is one of the papers. You would never know from their title, uh, the demonstration of X-ray Thompson scattering as diagnostics for miscibility in warm, dense matter, that what they were really talking about was diamonds raining out of the atmosphere of, of Uranus and Neptune. But in fact, this text is from their paper where they talk about it. And it all comes down to the molecules that are in the atmosphere. Methane, this is a, a, a sort of a chemical symbol for methane, <clears throat> which is a carbon surrounded by four hydrogens. Um, when you take methane and put it under extreme pressure, interesting things happen. And so here is a cartoon version of this really complex paper about miscibility in warm, dense matter. In the upper atmosphere of Neptune, we have methane. We can sense that with our telescopes and um, we can detect it in the atmosphere and model it. And so I have this little cartoon here of these methane molecules floating around in the atmosphere. It's not a lot of methane. It's only like 6% of the atmosphere. Most of the atmosphere is hydrogen, um, but there's enough methane for us to detect in our, with our telescopes. But when you get, when this, uh, when you go deeper in the atmosphere, that methane that's there has so much pressure on it that it dissociates. The hydrogens are broken off from the carbons and they start to all mix around together at great depth, all right? And um, then if you put that even under even more extreme pressure, as you get closer to the core, then all those carbon atoms are squished together. And what is a diamond? A diamond is just a whole lot of carbon atoms squished together. That's how they make diamonds. You know, they make diamonds in the lab by taking carbon and squishing it. And so that, that's what is happening deep, deep in the atmosphere, close to the core in here. Um, these carbon uh, atoms are being crushed into diamonds now. They are not beautiful, faceted, polished diamonds like this. This is just a cartoon. And they're not red either. The only reason I used red is because in my molecule, uh, it, the carbon was red. So I made the diamond red. Um, these are more likely to be uh, kind of what you see in the background, sort of weirdly shaped nuggets of carbon all smushed together. And at the same time that the carbon's falling out, what happens to all the hydrogen? It just starts to bubble up. And so it feeds more hydrogen up into the atmosphere. So um, it's pretty cool to think about that. Um, I don't think we'll ever be able to mine the diamonds on Uranus or Neptune. They're way too far in the atmosphere beyond the reach of our um, future uh, spacecraft. Our spacecraft will be crushed uh, by the time they got to that level in the atmosphere, but it's interesting to think about. So I've talked a lot about um, the need for future missions to explore these. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the plans that we have. Um, first of all, there is the James Webb Space Telescope. It is fully complete now. Um, here's a picture of the telescope when it was last deployed um, with its sunscreen spread out like that. I can tell you more about James Webb than you ever want to know, because um, I've been working on this project for over 20 years now. Um, but this picture was um, the last time it was deployed. It was then folded up. It's now um, being boxed up and getting ready to ship from Space Park in California on a ship out to the Karoo Space Park in French Guiana, which is where it will launch from on an Ariane 5 rocket. And um, I've been uh, working, as I said, on this project for 20 years. Uh, my program is designed to study 
all of the solar system that is available to Webb. Um, and uh, one of the objects that, of course, I started working on Webb to study was Uranus and Neptune, because I didn't see um, back then any chance of a mission happening, at least not in the short term. So I turned my sights to the future space telescopes. And um, this large uh, box uh, here, th these colored boxes are several of the infrared detectors that we have on James Webb Space Telescope. And this is one of our Keck pictures of the planet Uranus and its rings. And I like to joke with my astrophysics colleagues that, oh, we really designed this mid-infrared camera to look at Uranus because it's perfectly sized for the planet Uranus to study its atmosphere and its rings. And the squiggly lines in the background are some of the models that we've been doing of the atmosphere of Uranus, showing you the different kinds of chemistry that we expect to be detectable in the atmosphere with the James Webb Space Telescope. We will both get pictures um, from this camera, this infrared camera, and we will also be studying this reflected light to study the chemistry of the atmosphere. And we're going to be doing this for Neptune as well. Um, and um, I'm very excited about it. I'm, I really, I, I can't wait. Um, I, well, I can wait. I've been waiting 20 years. <laughs> I, can, I can wait a little longer. Um, you know, we, we're currently scheduled for launch at the end of this year sometime. Um, and so we're all hoping it's going to be in this calendar year. Like I said, uh, the, we're all packaging up and shipping and it's all, it's all happening now. It's really exciting. But we're also thinking about the future. Um, I'm thinking not only about what I'm going to do with Webb right now, but I'm thinking about what telescopes do we need to build so that Sean has a new telescope, you know, in 10 or 20 or 30 years. And all the young folk right now, um, what, what are we going to build for them? So we've actually been looking at brand new advanced concepts for space telescopes. And this is one uh, that we nicknamed Louvoir the large ultraviolet optical infrared telescope. It's like taking Keck and putting it in outer space. And to give you a sense of scale, um, this is how big it is compared to Webb. And this little tiny circle mirror here, that's the Hubble Space Telescope's mirror. That's its collecting area. This is how big James Webb will be when it launches. And this is the size of the next generation telescope that we're planning. Why are we doing this? Why are we thinking crazy ideas like that? Well, I already showed you this picture of Hubble that we took with a picture of Neptune that we took with Hubble. Let me show you a simulation of what Neptune would look like with that Louvoir telescope. That's not a that's a that's a Voyager image, but that's the resolution that Louvoir would have. It would be like having a flyby um, without having to do the flyby. Um, and so I'm really excited about that as um, a potential. And the same for Uranus. Uranus is even bigger. It'll be even more amazing. But I'm sure that some of you are saying, well, telescopes are all awesome, but what about actual missions? Why don't we have a mission to Uranus? Why don't we have a mission to Neptune? And the answer is, it hasn't been high enough priority for the United States planetary science community yet. The way we decide things um, is we have what's called the decadal survey. Every 10 years, we evaluate the state of science and we ask, you know, what are the priorities for the next decade? And the last decadal survey, uh, which was roughly 10 years ago, uh, the top priorities were Mars and Jupiter's moon Europa. The third highest priority was a flagship mission to Uranus. And my little uh, asterisk there is that we actually studied both, but we were told which one is best in the time frame of 2013 to 2022. And the answer based on the, um, the orbital logistics uh, was Uranus at that time. And so it, we said Uranus. And I, when I say we, I mean literally me. I was the chair of the panel for this 
decadal survey that evaluated giant planet missions. And so I and my team did the evaluation of what was you know, important. We ranked this as top priority for our panel for giant planets, but then we had to duke it out with the Mars people and the Venus people and the Mercury people and, and then the, the Enceladus people and the Europa people. And in the end, we came out third. And that's why we don't have a Uranus mission right now. All right. But, you know, hope springs eternal. Um, the next U.S. planetary decadal survey is happening literally right now. I heard a debrief this afternoon on it um, at our Outer Planets, NASA Outer Planets meeting that was taking place uh, yesterday and today and tomorrow. And there were many white papers about exploration of the ice giants. And so fingers crossed, I'm hoping uh, that we, uh, we prevail in the new planetary decadal survey. I wanted to highlight two missions that were studied and um, proposed. One of them was a mission just to go to Triton. It was called the Trident Flyby, and it was a small mission. It wasn't going to look at Neptune or its other moons, just Triton, and very focused. But it was going to try to look for those um, look for those volcanoes that we talked about, and see if it could figure out what was causing them and how they interact with the atmosphere and things like that. Um, it was not selected two Venus missions were selected instead of this one. So Trident um, is you know, still in the queue. Uh, we'll still keep looking. The other big mission that was proposed to the Planetary Decadal Survey, whoops, I went the wrong way, is a mission called Neptune Odyssey. Neptune Odyssey, this is like a sort of a front back a flyer. It's a full up mission to the Neptune Triton system. It's designed to look at all aspects of uh, the Neptune system. Everything that I've been talking to you about, all the things that I've said, these are mysteries. We need a, a mission for this. This mission was designed to do that. Um, some of the science is how do the interiors and atmospheres of ice giants form and evolve? What causes the strange magnetic field at Neptune? And how does it how does how do its aurorae work? Is Triton an ocean world? Is there an ocean underneath its icy crust? What causes its plumes and its volcanoes? And what's the nature of Triton's atmosphere? How does Triton's geophysics and composition compare to the dwarf planet Pluto that New Horizons flew by a number of years ago? What are the connections between Neptune's ring arcs and space weather and small moons? Um, and to do that, it would be a full up flagship and even have a probe that would be inserted into the atmosphere. It's big, it would require a lot of power, tons of science instruments. Those, all those little lines with dots are different kinds of instruments. Um, and so it's a, what we call a flagship. Um, it's, it's fully equipped like the Cassini spacecraft was uh, for Saturn. Um, so it needs a big rocket to launch. Those of you who are in the space game have heard of SLS. That's a large rocket being developed by NASA. Or it could be a starship like Elon Musk is doing. Or it could be, you know, whatever the next giant thing is. It takes 16 years to get to Neptune from when we launch with the fastest rockets that humans have created. And so if you uh, can see the dates there, we're talking about, you know, if we launch in 2033, all right, because it takes us a while to build the spacecraft. Um, if it takes us 10 years to build the spacecraft, then it takes us 16 years to get there. We will be doing the orbital work from 2049 to 2053. So when I see those numbers, those years, I do the math. <laughs> I will be <laughs> 80 years old at that time. Um, it's not gonna be me doing this. It's gonna be Sean and it's gonna be the, ki the kids right now. If you have grandkids who like space science, they're the kids, they're the ones who are gonna be doing the science because it takes that long. Um, exploring the outer solar system is multi-generational. 
I was one of the youngest people on the Voyager mission. Um, I joined like right after getting my thesis. And, you know, I'm now a senior scientist. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's the kids now, kid, people who are, you know, in high school now are the ones who are going to be doing this mission. Um, Voyager launched while I was a junior in high school. And I worked on it when I was, you know, a fresh PhD. So high school kids now, elementary school kids now, they're the ones who are going to be doing this Neptune mission. And, and you know, I'll be sitting on the porch of the old retired planetary scientists home with my, you know, virtual headset or whatever, uh, watching it uh, with joy and delight. But I don't think I'll be doing the science. Multi-generational. Ice giant exploration is also international. The last time I saw Sean and the last trip I was on pre-COVID was to London for an ice giant meeting in London where we were looking at the future exploration of the ice giants. And we wrote a, 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 a whole uh, issue of the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society about that. And so uh, this will be an international mission and it truly will be. Um, the European uh, Space Agency recently released its kind of equivalent of a decadal survey. They called it Voyage 2050. And in that, in their medium contributions to international missions, the number one medium class mission they wanna do is a contribution to a mission to the ice giants. They don't say NASA, you've gotta do it and we'll collaborate, but that was the clear message of this to me. Um, so what's going to happen with ours? Stay tuned. Uh, here's my, my hopeful uh, cartoon of what that decadal survey will say. Ice giants for the win. Explore Neptune now. Um, if that happens, you know, you will hear me cheering, you know, all the way from Virginia to Pittsburgh. Uh, I'll be so happy. Um, I did want to end with a little retrospective because sometimes People say, you know, why, why should we go back to Uranus and Neptune? Been there, done that, we did it already. And my answer is this, Voyager launched in 1977. Let me show you two other things that launched in 1977. One was the Apple II. <laughs> and some of you oldsters computer folks might recognize that old Apple computer. And this is the Atari gaming system that also launched in 1977. Our knowledge of Uranus and Neptune is made with this level of technology. That's what we flew to Uranus and Neptune. And what I would like to do is I would like to fly today's level of technology out there to Uranus and Neptune because we would learn so much more because our sensors are better, our detectors are better, our, our computers are so much faster. I mean, imagine you, imagine us trying to have this kind of a telecon with you know the 1977 technology, that's kind of what we're limited to for ice giant research. Now it's true, we've, we've developed adaptive optics, we have the Keck telescope, we have Hubble, but that's not at Neptune. That's not at Uranus. That's what I want to do. All right. So that's why I want to go back. And everything that we can we can detect in these systems has changed. Um, the, the cloud distribution has changed. The ring system structure has changed. The moon's reflectivity has changed. So the picture that we have from Voyager, both of Uranus and Neptune, that's not what those planets look like anymore. What did you look like in 1977? Is that what you look like today? Planets change just like people do. And so to truly understand these planets, we need to go back. And why are they changing? I can't, I don't know. We don't know, we can't see. We don't have any of the details. We have enough information with our telescopes to say something's changing, but what? and why and how and what's driving it, it's, that's eluding us until we get back there to those systems. So 
one thing hasn't changed in all of this. And the thing that hasn't changed is that we as humans seek to explore. I want to explore. I want to go back to Neptune. I want to go back to Uranus. I want to see these moons, these rings, these planets. Um, it's time. <laughs> Let's go back. So with that, I'll just uh, end with this fanciful picture of um, the Starlight Cruise Lines and snowboarding Triton. Starline uh, Cruise Lines with regular departures to Uranus and snowboard Triton. So with that, I will say thanks for your attention and I will answer any questions that you might have about Uranus, Neptune, Hubble, James Webb Space Telescope, or anything else uh, that you might be interested in asking me. All right, I'm back. Any questions? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Hi, Sean, I can see you now. It's good. Fred, you're muted. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, I was going to suggest uh, that we tap the, type the questions in the chat because it's going to be pretty hard to, uh, to catch everybody who might raise their hand or whatever. Um, and um, I will uh, relay them. Or Heidi, can you see the chat? Yeah. OK, yeah. then I'll let you choose the questions you want to answer. OK, sure. Uh, Fred asked the question, uh, why do we use the infrared range specifically? And I think you're referring to James Webb Space Telescope. Um, also, uh, the NASA infrared telescope where we uh, were together. All right. Oh. Yeah. Um, astronomers actually like to use the full electromagnetic spectrum to study things. Um, Hubble Space Telescope, uh, it focuses primarily on visible wavelengths, optical wavelengths like we would see with our eye. So those images of Neptune with the great dark spot that I showed you from Hubble, those are typically uh, visible wavelengths of light. Um, one reason uh, we like to use the infrared is that the molecules that we know make up the atmospheres in Uranus and Neptune, um, remember I showed you the, the hydrogen molecule with, uh, uh, excuse me, the methane molecule with its carbon and four hydrogens. Those kinds of simple molecules, they tend to vibrate and rotate. And when they do, they give off light and the, the specific light tends to be in the infrared. So the molecular signatures of uh, the things like ethane, methane, um, acetylene, diacetylene, these are all things that we've detected in these atmospheres. Their characteristic emission is in the infrared. And so that's why we liked to go to infrared telescopes to study the chemistry. Um, now, Webb was designed to be an infrared telescope for actually a completely different reason. It was designed to find the first galaxies and the first stars that ever formed in the universe. And what we have learned over the past 50 years or more of astrophysics is that um, our universe is expanding. You might have heard about that. And it's also accelerating as it expands. And when we study far away objects, we find that when they move away from us, their light is shifted into the red. That's called redshift. And so the most distant galaxies are all shifted into the red. And so when we were designing a telescope to find the earliest stars and earliest galaxies, we couldn't look at visible wavelengths. That's not where the light is. The light from these stars is shifted into red wavelengths. And so that's why James Webb Space Telescope was designed as an infrared telescope. Fortunately for me as a planetary astronomer, there is terrific science to be done in the infrared range, all that molecular chemistry that I was talking about. John asks, any ideas why Uranus is lying down in its orbit? Yeah, so here's my Uranus, my cartoon <laughs> Uranus, all right. And so most planets like Saturn and its rings, they spin like this. Uranus is tipped sideways. So it spins sideways like this. It rolls around the solar system. And why is that? Um, 
the, the earliest theories were that uh, some catastrophic collision took place early in the formation of the solar system that took that nascent uh, planet that was Uranus and whacked it really hard and knocked it over. And there are computer simulations of these massive collisions as well that could uh, result in this knocked over planet. Um, if that's the reason, it happened very early on in the formation of the solar system because the whole ring system and moon system are all rotating sideways, all right? So the whole thing is, is on its side. Um, a number of years ago, people had a, a slightly more uh, nuanced idea. They thought maybe uh, we know that these planets, we now know that where the planets are today is not where they formed. We know that these giant planets especially have migrated in the solar system. These Uranus and Neptune have migrated outwards. And we know that because of dynamics in the Kuiper belt that we could talk about if you want, but take my word for it, it's true. And some people were looking at how these planets interact with one another as they migrate and they're orbiting, but they're moving out. And so there were some theories that suggested that um, orbital resonances, like when you get to a certain number of uh, spacings from Saturn that, you know, you can pump up the, the resonances between these objects so that, you know, they can wobble a little bit, but then it's sort of like when you swing in a swing and kick at the bottom, it pushes you up. This resonance uh, interaction was torquing the planet a little bit. And they were saying over the, over the millions of years, the torque of the rotation axis of Uranus could just slightly over millions of years torque it off to the side, right? And they had these really interesting computer models that showed that might work. Um, and I remember reading a paper, I'm like, huh, well, that's a new way to explain the tilt of Uranus's axis. But then that paper was retracted because they found a bug in their computer code. And then once they fixed that, it couldn't tilt it over anymore. So we were back to the catastrophic collisions. Recently, this idea of orbital resonances and pumping has come back. And so that is now back in the mix. So we don't know for sure if, whether it was a giant collision that knocked it over, whether it was orbital resonances, or maybe it was both. Maybe there was a collision and then the orbital resonances picked up and kept it going. Um, I'm not sure how we're gonna ever know the answer to that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a puzzle that we may just have to rely on ever more sophisticated models. I'm not sure there's an observable that we can measure that will tell us what the cause was. Anyone else? Are we on? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 You, you talked about metallic hydrogen and ice. Do you have a sort of a different definition of what I think of metallic and ice is than, than most people? Uh, explain. Yeah, I have a different definition than most uh, non-planetary scientists would, but the definitions I use are the planetary science definitions. So we do use our terminology differently. Okay, so let's talk about metallic hydrogen. What does that mean? When when most when um, non-planetary scientists think of metal, I don't have any metal here. I was looking for something <laughs> metal. Uh, oh, I got my my uh, you know my hole punch here is made out of metal. It's hard. It's shiny. I think that's metal, right? Um, what we mean when we say metallic hydrogen is not this at all. What we mean is that hydrogen that has been compressed so much that the electrons that encircle the nucleus around the hydrogen actually start to be pulled off and and start to move through this mixture of hydrogen nuclei. And so the electrons are flowing freely through that mixture. Like and they would in a metal then. Like mm -hmm. they would in a metal, exactly. So what, when I say metallic hydrogen, I mean highly compressed hydrogen that has been transformed to a state where the electrons are dissociated from the nuclei. That's what I mean, yeah, yeah. 
How about ice now? Uh, ice. Okay. So I kind of started, we have a joke um, in, in, um, in astronomy, right? But basically that um, you basically have hydrogen and then you have everything else. All right. So you got hydrogen and helium and then ice. That's what we got. What we mean by ice in this case is a mixture of carbon and hydrogen or nitrogen and hydrogen that is in uh, some kind of molecular form, like I showed you for the methane molecule. And um, we mean that it is not in a gaseous form, but it is more in a solid form. And that we call that ice, it's jargon. We often say we should not call these ice giants, we should maybe call them water giants, because this idea of ice makes everyone who is not a planetary scientist think of like, you know, like ice cubes and cold. But what we mean by ice is just, we just mean hydrocarbon mixture, and it could be water, and it could be a briny solution of hydrogen or ammonia and it has clouds in it, but it's not hydrogen. Maybe we ought to call them not hydrogen giant planets, you know, because that's really what kind of what we mean by the ice. It's a bit of a misnomer. Right. Yeah, sorry about that. Right. We argue about it. Yeah. Uh, the one thing we will, we, we do, I mean, I mean, there's one of our, one of my colleagues, Fran Bagenal is adamant that we should not call these things ice giants. It is an ice. Why do you call it that? You know, I, 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 we haven't come up with a better name, you know, other than like what we do in, in the world of exoplanets where we have, you know, Jupiters and Neptunes and Earths, and then we have sub Neptunes and super Earths and, you know, we don't use that word ice. We, they call them Neptunes <laughs> in, the, in the exoplanet community. They've got, you know, Neptune-like planets or they got sub-Neptunes or super-Neptunes. Um, but in our solar system, you know, we call them ice giants. That's, uh -huh. that's the class. We can't call them Neptunes because then that is disrespectful to Uranus. And we can't call them Uranuses because that's A, it's too hard to say. And B, you know, we just can't use the name Uranus anywhere anyway, because people make fun of us, so we don't. There's a question from Doug. Uh -huh. How does discovery of similar exoplanets help in the understanding of Uranus and Neptune? That's a really good question. Um, I would say that the discovery of exoplanets has revolutionized our understanding of our own solar system and the history of the formation of the solar system. And that's because with just our solar system, with our four rocky planets close in, then the asteroid belt, then our four giant planets, and then the Kuiper belt, we had a really lovely story about how planetary systems form. And it went something like this. You have a nascent sun that's surrounded by a swirl of dust and gas. And out of that dust and gas, things start to clump together and form little tiny planetoids. And then those little tiny planetoids or planetesimals, they start to clump together to make planets. And close to the sun where it's hot, it kind of blows away all the gases and uh, the ices, the water, the methane, and leaves you with a lot of rocky stuff. And that's why you get rocky stuff close in like, like uh, Earth and Mars and Venus and Mercury, but further out in the solar system where it's colder, all that dust and ice and stuff that hangs around and that gets incorporated into these big planets. And that's why you get these giant planets further out. And it worked for our solar system. It did not work for exoplanets because the first exoplanets that were found were hot Jupiters. These were Jupiters that were in at the orbit of Mercury. How could that be? Uh, they couldn't have formed there. They must have formed further out and moved in. Um, and what we have found is we have found a huge diversity of planetary systems with hot Jupiters, cold Jupiters, warm Neptunes, hot Neptunes, uh, you know, and, and just this huge diversity uh, that doesn't at all fit the story of the formation of our solar system that we had. So we've had to come up with a new 
understanding of solar system formation and how it got how our solar system came to be. And that's been really helpful for us to understand uh, uh, our, our solar systems. Now, in terms of Uranus and Neptune specifically, it's tricky because we have not yet found true solar system analogs. The techniques we use to find exoplanets are more sensitive to big planets closer into the stars just because of the techniques we use. And if you want, we can talk about that. But um, we haven't yet found systems that have cold Uranuses and Neptunes in the configuration that we have in our solar system. And so um, it's gonna be a while, I think, before we get there. We're developing the tools to be able to do that, but we're not there yet. Um, I will say though that the thousands of exoplanets that we now have, have changed the way planetary scientists think about planets, um, especially those of us who um, work in astrophysics as well. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, they, in the solar system, they're, they're kind of starting to zero in on like super duper details of things and they kind of lose the big picture. This discovery of exoplanets really has changed our perspective of planetary systems both outside and, and our own planetary system. And I think that's really important and, and powerful. So Fred asks, if you were a new graduate student in planetary science, what thesis topic might you choose today? Wow, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when I chose my thesis topic of Uranus and Neptune, I chose it specifically because we knew so little. I mean, we were right at the edge of, of being able to know anything about Uranus and Neptune. And so um, I chose the topic because it, there were so many questions. And so um, a lot of young people today want to study exoplanets. Um, sometimes when I meet uh, uh, other astronomers and, and they say, what do you study? And I say, I'm a planetary scientist. And they say, oh, I love exoplanets. Because that, that's to them, that's what planetary science is now today. Um, if I had to pick a topic in the solar system, you know, I, I, I don't know what I would do. I would depend on what missions are launching um, and what, what, what tools are available. Um, you know, I, I've, I've always enjoyed Uranus and Neptune because even though we sent that one flyby past them, in 1989 uh, and 86, um, there have been no other missions. So the work that I do and that I have done over my career, it, it, it's every observation of Neptune is like new. It's like no one has seen it. It's new. No one else can see it. I have to use the biggest telescopes on the ground and in space, and they're a very precious resource. So when we do get a little bit of time, we're going to make a new discovery. And I I like that. I like making new discoveries. I like solving puzzles. Um, so I don't know exactly what field it would be, Fred, but it would be something where I'd need to use the best tools and I would be able to solve an interesting puzzle because that's that's what I like to do as a scientist, solve puzzles. Anyone else? Well, I don't know whether uh, Heidi can hear applause, but uh, thank you so much for your generous uh, use of your time. It's great to see you again after, uh, well, we keep interacting now and again. Um, and uh, uh, I think everybody here can see why I enjoyed writing your biography so much. Um, and there are still a couple of little stories that I wish I could put in there about you and your siblings, but uh, uh, it, the book, if you have a chance, it's in the library. I'm sure Mark has more than one, maybe even more than one copy. Um, but Heidi's life story is interesting. Uh, it has a lot of uh, aspects that uh, resonate with some of the issues today. Uh, I won't, uh, I won't go any more. Just kind of tease it like that. But um, I hope some of you will be inspired to have a look at the book. Uh, and again, thank you, Mark, for arranging this. Thank you, Heidi. Anyone else? Last chance. Okay. Uh, 
Mark, it's back to you if you have anything you want to add. Okay, bye bye. All right, bye. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the good questions. Bye bye.